Welcome to another edition of Dr. The Doctor in the chat room. Welcome to my 94.7 FM Gospel Giant family. I am so glad you are back here with me today. And I am eager for you to hear from my special guest, Dr. Wynn, as we continue discussions surrounding race relations in America. Uh, I want to, as I always do, remind you that um, you are to, you should get tested if you have not gotten tested and if you do not know where you can just contact your local health department and they can steer you in the right direction um i hope that you guys are using the ne necessary precautions to stay safe as we are still in the midst of the COVID 19 pandemic um dr Wynn, thank you for being here today and uh, i want you to tell our listening audience who you are uh, just give us a little bit about your background um, before we move into our discussion today. Thank you so much for being here. Dr. Shah, thank you for the invitation. I'm excited to be here. Um, as you mentioned, my name is Dr. Kenyatta Wynn, and um, I currently am an administrator in early childhood education and also the diversity, equity, and inclusion coordinator at a school here in Houston, Texas. So I'm pleased to be here today. I'm a mother of four, ranging from um, eight years old, and then I have a 17, 18, and 19-year-old. God bless and you. <laughs> yes, and my wonderful husband, Donald. So I am thrilled to be um, on your show today, and thank you for inviting me. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, so, you know, we have this, this current, these current events in the world, uh, so much going on. I mean, we, we were just kind of hit with COVID-19, and now we have all of this, um, all of the things that are going on related to race relations. And I think that's putting it lightly. It, sometimes it feels like it's racial wars. Uh, we are back with the Black Lives Movement matter, uh, which is back in the headlines nationwide now. I mean, we've seen it before. Um, but now there is like nationwide coverage of the Black Lives Movement. Um, and two thirds of the US adults say that they support this movement. 38% uh, say they strongly support it. This sentiment is particularly strong among Black Americans. And although the majority of white, 60% in fact, Hispanic, 77%, and Asian, 75% express at least some support, what do you make of this movement now? Um, how can this movement pr propel us forward in terms of um, what the work is going to look like? Absolutely. Um, you know, well, I think those numbers are um, trending appropriately and they're reflective of everything that is transpiring right now. I feel like in our country, we were already on the you know precipice of tipping over um, and then COVID happened and America kind of just split wide open. Right. And I think during this splitting, people's eyes became um, more discerning. I think people uh, understood that when you say Black Lives Matters, it doesn't mean that you're excusing or excluding um, any other lives. And so I think that was important. And I think that we are in a place and a time where change is not only um, imminent, but it is imperative. Mm -hmm. And so having a movement who already was standing behind um, Black Lives and saying, it's not that we're, you know, more important than anyone else, but we are the ones who are being directly affected at this time. I was reading an article in the New York Times, and it, it said something that was extremely intriguing to me. It said, as a group, that African American people are the only race who started in this country with zero, with nothing. And when you think about it that way, you understand why we are where we are and you're grateful for um, leadership and voices like Black Lives Matters and many others who have brought attention and support to a community of people 
who are suffering from, um, you know, direct systemic, um, you know, oppression. And so I'm grateful that now we are stopping, but I think that other groups are joining us because they're beginning to understand exactly what we meant or what we mean. And, you know, when you have someone who can take their knee and put it on the neck of someone and unapologetically look into a camera, you realize that the issue is bigger. And that was in every home, through every phone, through every computer, through every yeah. iPad through every television. And so I think um, that there are more allies now and more allied programs because they understand the words of what Black Lives Matters really mean. Yeah, and, and I, I tend to think that the people that don't, still don't get it, you know, will probably be the people that won't ever get it. And I, I want to believe that there are more people that do get it than don't. Um, and, you know, when you were talking about what we started with, that's one of, that's been a common theme for um, the discussions on all the shows about race relations is that we have had such limited resources and we've, we've done great things with such limited resources. And so I can only imagine um, the creativity going forward with the resources that, that we have now versus what we started with. Yeah. I agree. Um, so let's talk about um, the protest and bringing people together from different racial backgrounds uh, to talk about race. And people from different racial backgrounds working directly with, with, with Black people um, people across party lines. Um, for example, 67% of Republicans and Republican leaders say that organizing protests and rallies are not too or not at all effective in bringing about equality, while 49% believe that this is true and getting more Black people elected and getting them more, more elected to office. Um, how effective do you think the protests are um, because I, I, I read an article where uh, a young man, Byron Jones, I believe is his name, was saying um, the protests are necessary. He even believed that the rioting to some degree, you know, was necessary. Um, how do you, how do you see it? You know, it's interesting. I mentioned having four children and um, I think about when the four of them have a common cause that they want to get across to their father and to me. If one of them comes to talk to us, we're kind of listening. But when all four of them are on the same page, you know, it really makes us stop and think, well, maybe it's, you know, something we could see differently. So, you know, I liken that to the protest that sometimes when one person is saying something, something, we're not really listening. But mm -hmm. when you have a group of people working together in the same, you know, vein in a peaceful manner, um, and we know and we've seen on television, sometimes these um, protests are not peaceful. But um, I think the initial goal is to try to accomplish things in a peaceful way. I think you can bring about change. We saw it happen with the civil rights movement. We saw it happen with the suffrage movement for women. It is a way to get people's um, um, you know, attention. And so I think that it is our right to protest. And um, I think it's a, a way to have your voice heard. So your voice is heard. And I've really appreciated what I've seen, the different parties, like you said, um, some of some people are dismissing it, but I think more people are coming together. And I'm actually seeing um, people cross party lines to come together in, you know, unity for what people believe is right. And I think when you talk about justice and equity for everyone, everyone wants that. Um, I've been reading a lot about privilege and one of the things that stood out to me is the holder of privilege does not realize often that they have that privilege. So, you know, it's interesting. I think as more people um, become woke, as we like to say, I think, you know, this is one way that they can get involved. Another thing is that people are home right now. So in the past, when they would have been at work and couldn't 
didn't participate in the protest, you know, they may watch them, they may donate to a cause, but now they're actually getting out there on the front lines because they're working from home and they have, you know, or they many people have lost their jobs. They're in positions now where they can get out and, you know, lend their voices. So I think there's a place for peaceful protests. Yeah, so it sounds like you are educating yourself you know, you, you are talking about, you know, people of privilege, not necessarily uh, even recognizing that they are a person, persons of privilege. Um, it, you know, how important do you think it is for us to educate ourselves? You know, we want people of other ethnicities to educate themselves about us and, you know, who we are and um, our culture and, uh, the way we think and the things we do and the things we like. How important is it for us to do the same? I mean, we've been considered the minority, you know, over time. And I, I just feel like maybe we've just kind of been in this rut and we want everybody to see us. How important is it that we see others? Um, I love that you asked me that question. One of the things I started doing in the beginning, because we were in the middle of a move from Nashville, Tennessee to Houston, Texas, when um, many of the protests started. And, and so I wasn't out there on the front lines of, um, you know, protesting, definitely in support of um, equity and justice for all people. And I came home and I said, you know, I've got to do something. I don't know what that something is. And I started thinking about all of these relationships that I had built over the years being an educator with so many amazing parents from different, um, you know, political parties, different socioeconomic backgrounds, different races and ethnicities, different, you know, genders. And I was like, how can I use these relationships that I have and create an opportunity for conversations around race? And so I started a book club around the book, anchored around the book, um, The Warmth of Other Sons by Isabel Wilkerson, which is about the Great Migration. And so really, I wasn't getting that deep into thought. I was like, okay, I'll start this book club. 50 people will come join the book club and we'll just have the hard conversations. I'm going to be really transparent. We're going to have the tough conversations. We're going to talk about privilege. We're going to talk about biases and invited a few friends. The group has grown to 740 people. Oh, wow. That's awesome. We had, we had 700 people after a week of, um, of me starting it. But in that process, as the way I do it is we have discussion questions around the book, but in between each day of discussions, I post information um, so that now it becomes a resource for people. So if you want to read about privilege or you can check your own privilege or um, check your own biases. Yeah. Um, and so to answer your question, I started educating myself while I was doing that because I didn't want to randomly post an article that wasn't relevant or, you know, I'm not in this group trying to make a point. I'm in this group trying to educate and provide opportunities for people to, um, to learn new information because that is what I do. What I found was that I was educating myself. I, my kids every night at dinner, I'm like, did you guys know this? And oh my gosh, did you know this? And so, you know, we talk about um, everything that is going on. And if you don't know your history, if you don't understand why we are where we are today, it is hard to have a cohesive conversation or dialogue about where we're going. We have to understand that there is a gap in wealth. We have to understand that that, um, systemic oppression is real. We have to understand that if you start it from nothing, it's going to take you much longer to get where other people are. We have to understand that our um, judicial system is operating just the way that it was designed to operate. So by educating ourselves, we now know how to dismantle certain things so that we can build back up. So yes, to answer your question, um, I have, and my husband is probably like, um, uh, he's back in history class because every morning and every night I'm just you know <laughs> telling him something new he's yeah. in the book club and he goes and reads a few of the things but I'm like honey can you believe this and did you know this and having conversations with my children who mind you are highly educated about this um, you know I am very impressed with the information that they understand about their history so we're having conversations now about how do we become active how do you take the information you know and become a change agent with that information Mm -hmm. So yes, I, I may be black, but I'm learning a lot of black history. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
you know, it's interesting when you were talking about the biases, because I think one of the things that people don't realize is that the biases, no matter what field you, you go into, you know, if you become a law and law, you know, get into law enforcement or healthcare or education or whatever it may be, um, you bring your biases with you. And, you know, I think we just, when we're thinking about law enforcement in particular and like p police brutality, uh, we don't think about the fact that these people brought those biases with them. Yes, they, they you know, vowed to protect and serve, you know, but they still have those biases. Absolutely. And the other thing is that you, what you bring with you is your privilege and, you know, people... <laughs> We all have privilege. If you woke up this morning and you didn't have to worry about where you're going to have food to eat or a place to live or clothes to put on your back, that's a privilege. If you woke up this morning and you're in a two-parent household, that's a privilege. Mm -hmm. What we're talking about is identity privilege, privileges that are afforded to you that you did not earn because you were born into those um, privileges. And so that is what we have to understand because I have to tell my own children, you, you have privilege. You know, We don't want to look at someone else and say, oh, they're so privileged. We all have privileges, mm -hmm. but we're talking about identity privileges and how those privileges shape the biases that you're just talking about. Yeah. Um, the, the killing of George Floyd moved that needle of racial equality, just a, just a tidbit, I, I say. Um, what do you think the, the difference was with this in terms of getting people to act? And do you think that this incident is going to go down as the change agent? I ask that question because, I mean, we've had Trayvon Martins, we've had Sandra Bland's, we've had Breonna Taylor's, we've had Aubrey, uh, Ahmaud Aubrey's, you know, yet it was, as you said, um, every iPad, every television screen, every, every smartphone, it was, it was everywhere, right? Um, so... Do you think this is going to be considered the change agent? Well, I think there are several things that we have to consider. Um, you know, I heard an analogy today. If you had a pan with a bunch of holes in it and you pour water into the, the pan, the water is going to gravitate to those holes and it's going to, to run out. You know, so when we think of America right now, we're thinking, you know, we have a lot of holes that we're trying to um, patch up. And every time we patch one hole up, we have water seeping from another one. I think we will look back and realize that there have been lots of tipping points in our history. There have been lots of things that just pushed us right over the edge. So I think we'd be remiss if we said this would be the last thing that would be a wake up call for us. But in this moment, yes, it is the thing that um, feels very different from the past. Um, you know, I think when we look over it, we are going to realize that back to what we talked about earlier, COVID has a lot to do with this. People are home, people are engaged, they don't have any, you know, not that they don't have anything else to do, but they don't have normalcy as they once had before. So they're locked in to the television, they're locked into what's going on in the news, they're locked in, you know, to their phones. And I think this was the tipping point. And a lot of things that people have not been talking about, I have not heard this much tied into what happened, but the um, incident in Central Park with the, um, you know, the African American yeah. man and the, the woman Bird who- watcher the bird watcher who essentially was just going to tell a lie on him and said, I'm going to do this. I have not heard it tied in often, but they're very close in timing. And I feel like that incident woke up white America in the sense of, oh, people do just make up stuff that, you know, really isn't happening. So that happening, um, you know, with Ahmaud Arbery happening right then, and then you had, you know, George Floyd, of course, Breonna Taylor. I think that it was what kind of just bust the pipe, you know, pressure bust the pipe. I think it was that thing that just bust the pipe wide open. So I, I think we'd be remiss to say that it's the only thing. I think it's one of many, but I think black people are tired. I think they're exhausted. And I think in saying it, you know, you can say it so many times, but when people have to watch it, I think they have to own it. I mean, I think they have to own it when they see it, you know, happening right before their eyes. And that is definitely what happened with George Floyd. I agree. Um, and that incident in Central Park, I, I, I would agree. That was one in which I believe people across the ethnic, ethnic aisles um, were like, 
flabbergasted, right? Because you know that that, that was a mindset. Hey, if I want to get what I really want from this, all I got to do is call and say, uh, I have a, I'm being threatened by a black man. Yeah. Um, so what should not only black America, but America in general, and I'm speaking of the America that believes that there should be justice for all, what should we be doing right now to ensure that we don't ease up and that we don't go back to, um, business as usual. Let's talk about that. When we come back from break, we will be right back on 94.7 FM. And we are back on 94.7 FM, and I am still here with Dr. Wynn, and we are talking about race relations in America. Uh, when we left, we were talking about um, what we can do to ensure that we don't go back to business as usual. I just would hate to think with the work that is being done and uh, will be done, and then we will get back to the same place. Um, sometimes I often think about the civil rights movement and all that was done, right? And have we really done a good job of moving things forward? How can we not go back to business as usual? Yeah, I think one of the things that we have to do is we have to look in the mirror at first um, right away and we have to realize that race has been weaponized in America. That's one of the things that we have to do. We have to admit that something is wrong and then we can work towards healing and trying to fix it. So some ways to do that is to look at the leadership in our um, you know, businesses. Do they reflect the world? Do they show um, a variety of images? Are they diverse? Many corporations and companies need to have leadership and diversity training. Um, we need to ensure that when these statements are being released, these statements of inclusivity um, from different companies, that we hold them accountable and, and ensure that they're following through. We want to make sure that they're just not being reactive and, and you know, submitting a statement and support, but not something that they're really going to continue to pursue and make a part of the fabric of their company. Companies. Um, I think that it's important that we um, accept that there is an unpaid debt here and, you know, find ways, you know, I was reading today about um, 40 acres and, and a mule and how it never happened, you know, and so you have black people who never received reparations for anything. Um, they lost everything. And so understanding again that, you know, they don't have the same footing. It doesn't mean that you um, want pity or you want someone to feel sorry for you, but you want to have opportunity. And I think that our African-American communities need to continue to work together. We need to empower our communities. We need to understand the importance of an education and we need to understand the importance of wealth and not just any kind of wealth, but generational wealth, wealth that you will leave behind for your children and your grandchildren and so on and so forth. And that's going to be really important. It's going to mean to start thinking about where we invest our money. It's going to mean to start thinking about what is really important. If you have to decide, you know, make decisions between your needs and your wants, you want to focus on your needs and put that money away so you have them for your wants later. So I think there has to be a shift in um, our community's mindset as well. I think some of the onus is on us. When I was growing up, my mom would always tell me that I could only control myself you know, the external factors that are going on around me, I can't control those things, but I can control myself. So I think if we'll start with ourselves and start, you know, doing things that um, empower our community, that lift us up, and also in our language, instead of saying that Black people cannot get small business loans, let's say that small businesses are not giving Black people loans. You know, we want to change the narrative, change the way that we think about ourselves. We want to talk about how beautiful and how amazing we are, because if we built this country, we must be some pretty darn wonderful people. Yeah. So I think, you know, I think it's important that we start um, empowering ourselves. I think there needs to be accountability. I think that we need to start dismantling structures that um, do not 
build us up and lift us up. And we need to start holding policies, you know, creating policies that really are for equity and justice for all people. So I think there's so much that has to be done and I don't think we can do it alone. I think that um, we need to encourage our allies and, and you know, ally programs to be, to listen really hard so they can understand where we're coming from. They can identify, um, you know, how they can best walk alongside us. And I wanna stop using the word help us because I think whenever you're saying, well, how can you help? How can you help? There's a sense of um, that we're the victim and we're not, we're, we're not a victim. You know, what, what has happened in the past has happened, but we have to take that information to empower us for our future. Mm -hmm. Do you think that, I mean, in my, in my tenure of, of working, I've seen quite a bit of training, you know, diversity training and all of that. Do you think it's the training in the corporations or if it's really more or less the implementation of what we learn in these trainings? Absolutely. It, you can train all day long. You're exactly right. But if you're not following through and implementing and holding people accountable, there has to be zero tolerance for, you know, um, racist behaviors. We have to have more anti-racist programs and we need to be intentional about them and we need to make sure that they're following through. You're exactly right. Yeah, I think everything has been more of a check in the box. You know, we did those trainings, right? But they don't implement uh, what what's learned in those trainings. And, and people don't, people of color haven't necessarily felt comfortable conveying things that they experience you know you don't want to be told that you're just pulling the race card and you you know um and 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 you know not to say that 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 maybe that doesn't happen you know but i think most of the time people have you know there's validity to how people feel about what's happening to them whether in the workplace or otherwise you know you know dr shah i think you're so right and, and what you're referring to are those microaggressions that happen to us in our workplaces or in our play spaces where our children are or the schools where they attend and you're exactly right i think many times um you have the component of people being afraid to say something but then i think sometimes not even recognizing that, you know, a microaggression is, you know, happening. Absolutely. To them. <laughs> absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. Um, I'm very proud to say that um, our young people across Amer America are really taking a bold stance. I think that this is just a moment. It's a movement. Um, and what do you see the role of the younger generation um, in this movement to be? You talked about your sons and you, you have some teenagers. Uh, I have two young adult uh, children and I have three grandchildren. Uh, my, my, all of my children and my three grandchildren who are only six and four have all been a part of a peaceful protest. And I am so elated to be able to to say that even with the COVID-19, that they are a part of this history. Yeah, I think that they are a tremendous ally and asset to this movement. And you're right, it is a movement. And, you know, they're so savvy and they're so smart and um, technologically, they're like eons ahead of us, you know? And so while we're figuring something out, they've already, you know, sent it on social media, but they, you know, they spread messages quickly. They come together um, in, in, such a wonderful way to have these conversations that are very uncomfortable for us because they're not normal the way that they communicate with technology, but they have these communities and, and in these communities, they're talking about the inequities and, and injustice and they're, they're having conversations and they're saying, you know, if you're not part of the solution, you're part of the problem. And, you know, I love it. I absolutely love it. I have three Gen Z's in my house and, um, you know, they all have their own ways of expressing themselves and standing up, whether it's signing a, you know, a, a petition. We've had, we've talked about that. Make sure you read anything you're signing first, but you're, you know, you get to have those conversations, but whether they're signing, whether they're protesting, whether they're writing a poem, whether they're, you know, creating a song, whether, you know, they can reach so many people because of their social networks. And so um, I love what they're doing and, you know, they're definitely woke. So. 
I yeah. think we, we need them to get where we're trying to go. I, I can tell that uh, you are having um, uh, really good conversations with your sons and, and that you're not only educating them, they're educating themselves and they're being a part. Um, I'm just curious, have you guys had any conversations with your sons about um, how they themselves if they were by law enforcement? Have you ever had that conversation with them or did you, have you ever felt the need to? Yeah, so right now we actually, our daughter is our um, 17 year old and then we have 18 and 19 year old sons. And we started having those conversations um, many years ago. And, you know, it was one of those things when you talk about privilege and um, the privilege of, you know, a, 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 a young man who can walk out the door and his parents don't have to have that conversation with him. But we have those conversations, it feels like daily with our children about what to do if they're pulled over by, you know, law enforcement. Um, they've watched The Hate You Give, which is, um, you know, a movie and a, a book about um, police brutality and, and it's for teenagers. And, you know, they know, they know what they're supposed to do. And it's hard when you have to explain to them that that they're different, that the situation is different, and that our goal is for you to make it home alive. That is our goal. Everything else we can, you know, we can work around. Um, you know, we understand fear, we understand discomfort, but you need to do these things. And so, yes, we started having those conversations when they were young, and we, we still have them now. Yeah. Um, as, as we move this needle a bit towards change, we also know that we are still at risk for violence um, as among other things uh, being profiled uh, but the violence hasn't stopped there's been a rise in hangings across the nation um, what do you think the level of sacrifice is going to be um, that's going to align with this movement that we're in you know that's interesting because I oftentimes have felt like we as um, a community did not, or we were not protesting, we were not standing up the way they did during the civil rights movement and maybe um, many, you know, um, people in our past. And now I think that's changing. I mean, I, I think you're, you're really feeling um, the, um, the effects of people working in unity to bring about change. But to answer your question, I think that it is always dangerous when you do that. I mean, I think there is always um, a high level of sacrifice, an increased level of sacrifice when you are saying, let's change something. Um, some people being a teacher, I realize, do not have good conflict resolution skills. And so when they don't agree with what you're doing, they think hurting you can solve that. So I think anytime that we are um, changing something, anytime that we are leading for something to be different, especially on the magnitude or at the magnitude of where we are right now, this movement, there is always going to be sacrifice. And so, um, you know, I think the, the greater sacrifice is what, you know, comes out of it for the, the larger good of the community. Um, and that sacrifice is always there. I always think about, you know, Dr. King paying the ultimate price with, you know, his life. And in many of his conversations and in his speeches, he would allude to the fact that he knew that, you know, being assassinated, he didn't use it in those words, but that, you know, he, that was the ultimate sacrifice, that there were people who didn't agree with him. You know, he didn't expect to live a long life, that would be a luxury. But I think anytime you are fighting for change, you, you, you know, you're in a war, you're in a battle, there is the chance that, you know, the ultimate sacrifice. And I think in these situations, they're, um, they hurt more than in, if you were in a, in a war per se, because they are truly um, people inflicting harm and pain on people just because they have a different view or because of the color of their skin. Those are the, yes, those are the things that make it really hard. Yeah. Um, Dr. Sekou, um, 
was say who Franklin was on one of my shows in the past uh, on the race relations. And he uh, brought up a good point about Emmett Till and how, you know, when they were intentional about the public viewing Emmett Till in the state and he was in, and he, the alignment was actually to what happened with George Floyd. It was. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I just think it's, it's sad. Um, and we don't know what the sacrifices are going to be. Um, we don't know who they will be, but there are going to be some more in my, my opinion, Dr. King's in this movement that we're in, you know, to get us to where we need to be. Um, how far do you think we can get with this movement? And, and, and do you think our children are going to have to continue the work? You know, the work is never ending. That's, you know, one thing that I think we have to realize it, it presents itself in, in different ways, but, you know, we can look at the, you know, the marches, you know, going back beyond the civil rights movement, you know, earlier than the civil rights movement. And I just think that anytime you're dealing with humans, you're always going to have differing opinions and ideologies. And so those will always present opportunities for, um, you know, discord in your world and in your community. My hope is that some of the systemic issues that we have, as I said earlier, can be dismantled and we can move into um, an area that is more equitable and that, you know, is more just for our people. But I think there will always be something that, you know, we're challenged with, something that we're facing. I think our children will still continue, you know, to work in this vein because we're talking about four centuries we're talking about more than 400 years of getting to this point. So I'm excited. I feel blessed to be a part of this movement, to be a part of this time and to be able to collaborate and join hands with my own children in this work. So um, I think there will always be work to be done, but um, I do think that we are making great progress. Um. Let's talk a little bit about uh, the police brutality uh, and the use of excessive force by police officers, um, which is another issue that we know we've, we've been facing. Um, there are some intentional, intentional discussions surrounding the standards that continue, uh, constitute brutality rather, um, and what the consequences should be for those law enforcement officers that violate those standards. Um, this issue is widespread, and since we know that people in law enforcement, as I said earlier, bring their biases with them, um, is, is there any, anything we can really do to prompt change in this area? And if, if so, what would you think it would be? I do think that there are things that we can do. And, and, you know, one of the things is we started the conversation, you know, off with, we have to know our history. Um, when we talk about, you know, much of the, um, or many of the lynchings that were happening during the Jim Crow era, um, I think I read a stat that said 50% of the people who were participating in those were from police departments. So you had these, you know, police who were supposed to be, you know, securing the community and making the community feel safe, but they were part of the brutality that was going on even way back then. So now again, we're back to the conversation of systemic racism and systemic um, behavior that has been happening with police departments. So as you said, you know, when this happens for so long, you show up and it becomes part of your biases and it's normal for you. So one of the things that I think, you know, we have to do is we have to review the structures of police departments we have to review the funding and how the funding is being used. Um, we have to better understand what kind of diversity training and implementation and follow up, as you mentioned earlier, is going on. I also think we don't have a lot of de-escalation um, procedures for police officers. I have a dear police officer friend in um, Nashville, and you know she was saying that a lot of times it's from department to department. Of course, when it, it hits the news, people feel like, 
these are all police officers, these are all, you know, um, and she said, you know, in their police department that there are very, you know, um, clear policies on you, racism, on brutality, on, you know, how they will carry themselves as, um, you know, police uh, departments. And so, I had this conversation with her and so she kind of felt like, you know, they kind of, you know, it, they're all kind of lumped into one category. So I think there is room for change. I think, again, when we talk about looking at systems, who is in your leadership? Do you have leadership that is representative of the communities you're serving? You know, that's going to be important. So all of those things I think have to happen, but at the end of the day, and we've talked about this throughout um, you know, the conversation, there has to be accountability. There has to be accountability. There have to be zero tolerance rules in place that if you did not do these things and you didn't follow protocol and procedures, when you look back over the histories of many of these officers, they've, they have had you know, all sorts of warnings and altercations and, um, and issues that weren't addressed. They were dismissed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, is there a direct correlation between racism and this thing called COVID-19? Uh, we're going to talk about that. I want you to weigh on that when we come back from break. We will be right back on 94.7 FM. We are still here on FM with my lovely guest, Dr. Kenyatta Wynn, and we are talking about race relations in America. Um, Let's talk about the COVID-19. COVID-19 has killed over 120,000 Americans and is more susceptible to African Americans uh, due to certain underlying conditions. Um, so do you believe that there is a direct correlation between racism and the, the severe outcomes of COVID-19? I believe that the correlation is our, had already existed before. Again, it goes back to, you know, lack of affordable health care, um, lack of, you know, health or the health disparities that exist in our country. So I think those were already there. So if, you know, we're saying there is um, a correlation between racism and the outcomes of COVID, then I would say yes, because of the disparities that have already existed um, for African-American people. Okay. Um, as long as we have monuments that represent white supremacy, because that's another thing that's uh, become um, uh, an, a usual part of discussions in the media and, and what have you. Um, as long as we have these, I feel like we're, we're going backwards. Um, this is what an act activist actually said in Baton Rouge uh, about renaming a local school after the Robert E. Lee. Um, how important is the removal of these statues and monuments in terms of, uh, that represent racism in terms of the change that, you know, this oppression that, that we're in, how important is it? And I think oppression is the key word. Like we want to move from oppression to empowerment. And I, in my mind, if something is not relevant in the way that it can empower people, it does, there's no relevance in it. So there is a place for monuments. There is a place for history. Um, that type of history belongs in a museum. It should not be in a public place where my tax dollars are paying when I go to a state capital or um, I should not have to send my child to a school named after someone who I knew um, did horrific things to you know, her ancestors. So I do think that it is time for us to start revisiting. Many schools are, colleges and universities, parks, um, lots of communities are starting to look back and say, why are we idolizing these people? I saw um, something on Twitter, and I think um, it was just a, a little meme or something that said, if someone were to take your child, to kidnap your child and run away with your child and do horrific things to your child, would you in turn then want um, someone to put a statue up of this person for you to look at every single day? And mm -hmm. I think that's what we have to do. I think we have to take ourselves 
ourselves and put ourselves um, in the perspectives of others or to listen carefully. A lot of people say you don't understand until you have walked in someone else's shoes and know that those things do not bring exciting and motivating and empowering feelings to black people. Um, you know, many of these Confederate soldiers and much of, you know, what followed after Jim Crow and all of these different things, they were to terrorize Black people. These people were terrorizing Black people. And I think as we look and say we're, again, seeking equity and justice in a country that's supposed to be for everyone, that celebrating them is not something that I think we should do. Um, I saw an article yesterday um, and uh, it was a Black woman had written it and she said, my body is your Confederate memorial. Mm. Wow. Um, that reminds me of the, the scene in the movie A Time to Kill when he does his summation in the courtroom and he says, imagine your daughter being raped, drawn in a river, so forth and so on. You know, well, he was just saying, imagine this little girl. Now imagine it's your daughter. Imagine it's your daughter. Yeah. And I, I think that was really so powerful because it's so difficult. As you say, you know, when you're living the privilege, it's hard to see it as such, you know, but I think we do have to do a better job of putting ourselves in the shoes of other people. And as Dr. King said, you know, um, you can't, you can't expect a man to pull himself himself up by his bootstraps if he doesn't have any boots if he doesn't have it, it any sounds boots. really simple but it's so profound you know so profound um how can how can people that are not of color support the the movement that we're in and you know why do you even think that there are a number of people um standing up today boldly <laughs> I think silence is comfortable for people. I think that when you're a part of the majority, when you're not a part of the oppressed group, um, it doesn't always mean you agree with what is happening, but that you think about yourself first. How does this impact me? How does this impact my job? I can think of numerous occasions when um, Colin Kaepernick was kneeling and people who I thought were allies were, you know, on social media typing things like, if you don't want to stand, leave our country and all these different things. And um, other people would be in the chat who had an opportunity to stand up and they wouldn't say anything, but they would DM me and say, I should have said something. I'm so sorry I didn't say something. I didn't want, you know, anyone, whatever it may be. But really it was, you want your own security. You don't want to be ostracized from the group. You don't want to be seen differently. We as Black people, we don't have that opportunity. We don't get to do that. We don't get to, we don't have the privilege of saying, you know, I don't want to be part of this group. You know, and so I think that um, you have to speak up, you have to stand up. We need our allies to have a voice. We need them to use their platforms to advocate for change. We need um, them to be listeners. We need them to listen really hard right now and listen really carefully. We don't need them to feel sorry for us. We need them to join us on this journey and we need them to be change agents. Um, we need allying programs that are unapologetically on board. Uh, we watched the BET Awards the other night and it was phenomenal. The, the commercials were fantastic. Um, you know, we were watching the ESPN Awards the other night and the white athletes who were denouncing racism and saying, we're here to stand up. We are with you. But you know, Dr. Shaw, it's what you said. It can't just be lip service. You have to mean it. You have to say that you're standing up for us. You have to do the right thing. I saw where Serena Williams' husband stepped down. He stepped down from his board position um, as a white man and said that it had to be replaced by um, someone of color. He said because he, and I don't know if he's, I don't know if he identifies with being white, but he's not a black man. And he said that he wanted his position because he understood his privilege and he was stepping down for that position to be taken by a person of color those are the things that have to happen you can't just talk it you have to walk it mm -hmm. 
So with, with racism being such an indoctrination, you know, with some, I mean, you know, I think it's, we know it's all learned, right? But for some, they've just been indoctrinated into it. I mean, even with the support of people that are not of color, um, do you think we can prompt change with those people that have just been indoctrinated into this whole mindset? You know, I don't know what prompts a person to, you know, finally get to that point where they want to do something different. But I think continuing to offer opportunities in my book club, um, you know, one of the things I did was just listed. I opened up a whole feed for books about anti-racism, um, books for children, books for middle schoolers and teenagers, because you do have people where sometimes they may feel, you know, they're kind of so far gone, but if they can see the value of maybe educating people, um, you know, in their families, or sometimes people feel like this is not who I want to be, but it is who I am, but I don't want anyone else in my family to be this way, to have this struggle or to look at life this way. So I think giving resources, um, that's what I try to do. I try to offer opportunities for information and to educate. And I think that one thing that we cannot do as Black people is that even though we're exhausted, we can't take the attitude that we don't want to help our allies. I have heard that so many times. I don't want to talk to the white people. I'm not talking to them. I'm tired of talking to them. Well, you can't in one vein, be tired of talking to them, but in the other vein, hold them accountable for change. So I think we have to find, you know, ways in whatever is comfortable for you to, you know, be that, I guess, example and be that resource for people who want to do better. Mm -hmm. Dr. Wynn, what, what's next? What's next for us? You know, I'm a hopeful person and I'm an optimist. And I think that this is a time to really know what it is that we're trying to accomplish and it's time for us to go into full action implementation, accountability, as we've talked about. So we need to continue the work. We have to support organizations that are advocating for change and doing it the right way. We have to support one another as a community. I notice so many times as a community that we tear each other down instead of building each other up. And what we do not understand is systemically, it was designed for us to do that. So we've got to dismantle that. We have to go back to our roots of family and community and everyone taking care of everyone. You know, when you and I were growing up, so-and-so was on the porch watching everybody. You know, we hear those stories and we laugh about them and our kids are probably like, whatever. But that's the way it was. You know, that's the way it was. We were all looking out for everybody. And I think we have to go back to those times um, when we were doing that. We have to hold schools accountable. You need to know if your child's classroom has diverse books in their classroom. You need to know if your child is seeing images of himself or herself in classrooms daily. We need to hold teachers accountable and we need to hold policymakers accountable. We cannot be quiet right now. This is not the time, if ever, to be quiet. We have to use our voices to advocate for change and we have to be present and we have to be active and we have to know what's going on in all aspects of our lives and make sure you know your history. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you, do you want to share any final thoughts as we uh, move to a close of the show? I just want to say thank you, Dr. Shaw, for this opportunity, because I think that we have so many people out here who have ideas and who want to be change agents, and you're providing an avenue for that. I think sharing these conversations with your community of listeners is spreading the word, and you know, you're doing it in a way that multiple people can get the message. And I just continue to encourage everyone to keep fighting the good fight and that there's nothing that is too small. Anything that you do in the name of change and progress for people is part of the movement. So don't feel like, you know, I can't do something because I can't do something really big. Everything is needed um, for us to have be successful and to have progress. So just thank you for having me. 
And thank you. Thank you for being here. And thank you for helping me to continue this discussion on race relations in America. Thank you for sharing your views and your thoughts with us today. Uh, I thank all of you for joining us. And I want you to continue having these crucial discussions about race relations in America. And um, so we can all make changes in this way. Um, I hope you join us again on next Saturday at the same time at 2 p.m. on Dr. to Dr. in the chat room on 94.7 FM, and we will see you then.